Well, let's take a look at the stuff. So here we have this uh, Marchant Silent Speed 10D. Um, this is a little bit of an earlier version. You can see it has a white and green keycaps instead of the lighter uh, yellow and green. And also has the power switch here on the side, which they carried over from the old line Marchants, but they, they didn't have that very long on the uh, Silent Speed series. Um, you see it's not in the best of shape. All the uh, dials here are pretty dirty. Um, also it has the older style black division control keys, which they later changed to red. Um, this one's pushed down the division key and the middle dial clear key at the same time, so um, it's probably not so great. And I already have one of these, but you know, this machine I came on eBay for like $20 starting bid and nobody bids, so I figured I may as well. You know, when something is on sale for $20 and nobody buys it, a uh, good chance it's uh, headed for the dump next. So, you know, even if this machine is not going to be of any, you know, if we, even if we can't get it going, you know, it's still going to be, you know, parts machine. I think these things have like 5,000 parts or something crazy because they have the, uh, basically a 10 speed transmission for every column. So these are quite complex and a lot of parts in here, but anyway, hopefully we can get it working. Um, but if we can't, you know, 20 bucks for parts is not bad. So uh, I'm gonna start by taking the covers off just to get a look at what it looks like inside. Um, I look, when I looked underneath the carriage, it seemed like there might have been a little bit of rust there. So I went to, uh, Get a good look at what we have before we go any further. Um, probably going to pause for this because there's quite a few screws in the case. I don't think you can see me take all of them out. If we can get this out, or just the sides have to come off first, probably. Um, these machines were introduced in 1934, I believe, and I believe the D series came out first. Um, they have they came out with two. Silent Speed series, the D series and the M series. The D series offers automatic division, or the M series offers automatic division and multiplication via a on the fly multiplier, which would be right around in here. Um, it's just on this side actually. I do have a video on my Silent Speed 10D. Here. Check that out and see what that machine is about. Um, basically, the only multiplier is basically just like a uh, cycle counter. So you push the key down. Species kind of messed up. Uh, that has a key series of keys here from zero to nine. And you push the key down, it enters the number on the keyboard that many times, and then it shifts over to the next column. You enter the next number, and their idea with the silent speed was that the machine was so fast that um, basically you could enter the numbers on the on the final multiplier keyboard without any delay. Like by the time it entered one, the machine would have completed that operation. You would enter the next one right away without having to wait for the machine to catch up to you, which was not the case on the old line motions, so those ones you definitely had to give the machine a little bit of time to complete the multiplication before you could enter the next digit. But at the time these came out, these were the fastest machines on the market. And I think, I'm not 100% sure on this, so if anybody has any information that proves otherwise, I would appreciate it. But I think this is the last totally new um, calculator mechanism de devised. Um, I don't think anybody used the, they call this the proportional drive, which basically means that there's a 10 speed transmission and the, instead of determining, you know, how many teeth engage or disengage, like most other calculator designs, um, the wheel changes speed. So all the wheels in the accumulator that are being you know, added to or subtracted from are all turning for the same amount of time. They just have a different 
speed. So for example, if you have, say, a 9 in this column and a 1 in this column, um, both wheels will be turning for the same amount of time, like both this wheel and this wheel will start to turn. However, this one turns 9 times as fast as this one. So by the time this one has changed from 0 to 1, this one has changed from 0 to 9 because it moved much faster. Uh, and that is done via, like I said, a 10-speed transmission, or a 9-speed transmission, rather, where you know, it just picks a different, there's a different gear in the transmission for the speed of the driver wants to drive the um, accumulator position at. So I don't think any machine used that particular principle before this. And I think after this, basically every machine made was a refinement of an existing design. Like Martian used this functional drive all the way up until they stopped making mechanical calculators you know, sometime in the late 60s or early 70s. Um, and you know, all the other machines on the market, I, as far as I'm aware, uh, just or based off something similar. Um, that was already on the market, I should say. You know, like Freedom was based on the Alcalmer uh, design, leading its wheels. Um, Franz Vigo made pinwheel machines for the rest of their existence. I think they may have made some Alcalmer based machines as well, but I don't think there was any entirely new mechanism you know, based on an entirely new principle that was developed after this uh, in 1934. Um, like I said, if anybody knows of any you know, completely new designs that were developed you know, in the 40s or 50s, I'd like to know about it. Because I'm not aware of any. Right, so this all comes off. It's so attached here. So far, looking in the back, it doesn't look bad. We are used out in a moment. So I think this should come off now. I'm not sure if this is paint is coming off or just dirty. So we can get this uh, carriage cover off here. So as I was saying, the First one in 1934, I believe the 10D was first, and the 10M, which is the multiplier version, came out somewhat later. I'm not exactly sure how much later. Um, I don't think I've ever seen, I can think of any, anyway, I don't think I've ever seen a 10D with this switch here. So I may have eliminated that by the time they came out with the 10D. actually almost apart now. Oh. Another cool thing about this is this is actually an analog machine, essentially. Um, when you perform an operation, the carry is done by planetary gear drives, so for example, this wheel is at 4, so essentially that has moved this wheel, um, you know, 4 tenths towards the next digit. However, you don't see that here. Actually, you can see it better if I take this off. How about that? This is a 4. This is at, it's like a 0. Um, so essentially what has happened here is through the planetary drive from this gear to this gear, or this wheel to this wheel, this has essentially moved this one four tenths from zero to one. However, they have a adjustment mechanism which basically spring loadedly takes up that distance and move this, moves this back to zero. Um, and that's why you'll see if we can get this working or you can go watch other videos about this. This register will drop down to engage with the transmission mechanism down in here and when that happens, you'll be able to see that that adjustment goes away, and this will be, you know, not lined up with zero or one, but somewhere in between, due to the planetary job across here. So, 
or even the carriage in here is super complex compared to well, pretty much anything else. Um, the, uh, the Burroughs Comptometer key driven machines, so the Burroughs Comptometer clone, it's not really a clone because they actually have a different mechanism, but they use a similar planetary carry mechanism in their register as well. Just take these uh, little panels off the side. So I'm going to take this panel off the front too. And something else that's kind of interesting about this machine as well is there's virtually no cast parts. Um, there's one that I can think of, which is part of the frame, but I believe pretty much almost everything in here is all either stamped steel or forged, I believe, or machine. Now there's hardly any cast parts in here at all. Uh, so far, there's a little bit of rust there, but so far it doesn't look too terrible. Um, give a little look around once I get this last piece off here. There we go. Right, so we can rotate this side. Yeah, it doesn't look too bad. I don't really see. Really, it doesn't look that bad at all. It doesn't even look that dirty. It's not surprising. Here. And here you can see, this is the motor obviously, this is our super complicated gear train here. And you can see down in there some of the uh, transmission gears. You know, there's a different sized gears there for the uh, different speeds to select. Um, I think there's two different shafts. You can see this shaft here is for some reduction. Um, First of all, there's a guy called John Wolf who um, basically tears machines like this completely apart um, and then posts pictures of all the parts and how they work and everything. So I'll see if I can leave a link to that. You can get a better idea of um, what's down in here if we don't take this apart, but I'm not sure if I am going to or not. Um, so far, it doesn't look like it needs it, really. It looks pretty clean, actually. Um, well, let's see if I can leave a link to that so you can go check that out if you want to see exactly how that's built. And this other side again, it doesn't look that bad. This is just some kind of bumper for the case. Of course, that's rock hard, but... Okay, so I think what we'll try is... Some of these screws out of the way. I think we'll try just plugging this in and see what happens. Um, I'm not sure if we can hit the div stop key and get it to reset our division or what it's going to do. Um, there's nothing entered on the keyboard, so these are actually pretty sticky, so I'll have to do that. This is actually, that one almost wants to work. Yeah, some of these keyboard keys are not so great, though, so I'll have to look into that, but see, this is switched off, it looks like, so try plugging this in here. And let's see what happens. That's not great. I don't know if you can hear on the video, but I heard the motor hum, but nothing moved, so that's definitely not good. Get my plug back out of here. So we're not gonna that wrong. Let's take a look. Oh. It was one direction but not the other. So the motor itself is not seized. Perhaps the gear train is. So we're going to move it backwards but not forwards. So we'll have to look into sticking there. That one seems free. That seems free. Interesting. Unfortunately, you can't... I 
Yeah, so the gears up in the top here seem free. I wonder if something down in the bottom is used. I'll probably take this carriage off. Um, which actually is not super horrendous to do. There's basically just two shafts here. And pop this little so, uh, clip here comes out. And same thing on the one in the front. Let's see if we can get yeah, these shafts actually look pretty dirty, so they may not want to come out nicely. Yeah, I'm doing what I'm doing here. So, oops, little spacer came out. Um, this clip has to come off. I knew it off camera on the other side, it was fine. There we go. Then this shaft can go out either direction now using these spacers here. And then this clip also comes off. If we can get I'm probably going to have to fight with these shafts a little bit because they are not that clean. And they're stuck on this thing. I end up taking this out as well, which I usually don't have to do, but because these shafts are so dirty, it may be necessary. So that'll take those two pieces off. You now the shaft is more exposed, but I'm not sure it's gonna come out very easily. I mean, a little bit. I might have to. Oh, there it goes. That one came out. Okay, I was expecting that to be a lot more of a battle. This one, however, let's see if we can get this piece out of here. See if this will come off or not. There we go. See if this shaft will. Okay. All right. It's not expecting that to be that easy. This thing has to kind of lift up out of here. I don't know how to do this. Huh? This is engaged with. This piece here, you can move this over. I should be able to. Mm. All right, I'm gonna have to fight with this for a little bit because it is not really wanting to cooperate. with this a little bit I think this is not being super cooperative here. This piece is underneath it and also what's going on underneath it but it's free now so it looks like it's just these pieces here are being stuck on this. So let me fight this a little bit so if I can get the carriage out. So if they're in the carriage a little bit I was able to lift it up and out of there you can see this piece here um, this bar goes under the carriage and this piece goes on top of the carriage. That just wants to spring out like that. So we'll leave that there for now. Um, anyway, after getting it off, I started playing around with the gear train a little bit. And after playing around in here, I realized that it actually is the motor that seized. And this play here is just the, the play in this little, it was like a leather uh, dampening disc. Um, so that's why this is allowed to move you know, a certain amount here. That's just that play in this disc and the motor shaft itself is not moving. So what I'm gonna do is look into how to get this motor out of here and see if we can get it unstuck. Um, this is a different style of motor than uh, the other silent speeds that I've worked on. This is a Westinghouse motor. I believe the other ones used a GE motor with a um, 
you know, just a cast aluminum housing, but this one has a crinkle paint painted housing. Um, so let's see if I can get this out of here and see if we can uh, free it up. Well, I went a bit further into this than I was initially anticipating. Um, you can see I've taken this whole side off. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where I left off last on the video, but the motor is freed up now. See that spins. Nice and free now. Um, I think it was just this front bearing that was um, sticky. I took off this coupling plate here, you know, which is just hold on with the bolt and then has this little like fold over lock tab type thing that holds the bolt in place. Now, I took that out, took this back panel off and then there were two screws in here. I took out and then the motor case separates right here along this crack. Um, so this governor mechanism is pinned on the shaft so I didn't take the shaft out of this back part. Uh, I just took the front part off and the shaft out of that, cleaned that up, put it back together, uh, oiled it of course and you know it's perfectly fine now. So that's resolved. Um, so then from there I went on to looking at why the division key would not release and I thought I would take out this entire control mechanism because it's actually not attached in that many places. Um, you can see like here, here, here they just have uh, long screws uh, like, like, like this, long screws and there's just these little spacers that slide in there. There's long screws that go through. Um, so I thought I'd be able to take all those out and then lift this out the top. That didn't really work out so well. Um, mainly because this shaft went through the side. Now I was able to loosen up the side enough to lift it up enough to get that out. But then I discovered that this shaft, which was harder to see when everything's all together, runs back and connects something back here, which I could not get it to disconnect from. So I realized I was not gonna be able to get this out. So then I decided to try working it back in, which um, trying to hold this side up and trying to work this back into place just was not going very well. So I ended up taking the entire side off, um, which actually I thought it would come off easier than it did. It seemed like it was stuck on something in this area. So I have to you know, work that out when I put it back together. I'm thinking it was just stuck on this piece, but I haven't actually confirmed that yet. Um, this is the piece that goes through this couple of gears there. Um, and just looking at this, I think this is actually much cooler than I thought it was. Um, I haven't confirmed this yet, but it looks like you can see there's threads, or you could see if the thing would focus. There's some threads in that end, and there was a little plug, which is somewhere, probably this piece right here, perhaps. I think this might've been this little plug here that screwed in there. Um, and initially I thought that this end cap, this end piece here, because when I was poking through the side, which actually it's not gonna go back through this side. It'll go through this way. So it was just poking through the side like that. So I thought this was just a bushing, you know, a fix to the side. And then that screw was kind of like an end play screw where there was like a skinny shaft that would be inside of this bushing and then ran through that gear train. And then you could tighten or loosen the screw in that threads to move that shaft inside, you know, not really back and forth, but to kind of take up any end play that might be on it was my initial assumption. But when I, then when I took this out and discovered that's not the case, get this out of here now. It's a very tight slip fit in there. Um, anyway, took this out and looked closer at it. You can actually see there's holes in that shaft and there is something in there. And I'm thinking this actually is like a, almost like a grease cap type thing where this shaft is hollow and filled with grease. And you know, every so often you go in there and tighten that, um, that plug in to squeeze more grease through the shaft and into these holes to grease everything on that shaft is what it looks like to me anyway, which if that's the case, that's pretty cool. I've never seen that on a calculator like this before. Um, it's a pretty interesting uh, 
a proposition there. But then again, you know, this calculator has one of the most complicated gear trains of any of the calculators. So let's see if we get this in frame. If I poke something in here, yep, that's what it is. So that shaft is full of what once upon a time was grease and is now more like rubber. So this is where I can get that all cleaned out. Yeah, it's just you can even see how it's how it's gone kind of waxy there. Yeah, it's uh, pretty cool actually. I've never seen that before. Um, kind of interesting. I did get that cleaned out and then we stuff it and then remember every so often to come in here and tighten that to squeeze some more grease out onto the part. So that's yeah, pretty cool. Um, so anyway, actually looks like maybe the same thing here on this one. You can see there's a bit of grease around there and there's a little plug in the middle. I have to find a screwdriver to open that. I don't think I have one. I'm not sure that's small enough. This might not be. So yeah, I'm still looking to see if I can find something to get that out of there and have a, and check on that too. See if that needs to be cleaned out and repacked. But yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so anyway, while I have this all apart, I'm going to take these out and clean them because as you can see, you know, like around this one, there's a bunch of, you know, little crud pieces there. So it'd be good to clean all that out. Um, and another reason why I wanted to take this out was to give that a, a good cleaning too, because if we look at the top plate here, there's actually looks like sand on there. I have no idea where that came from. I don't think someone would have been using this on the beach, but um, I want to make sure that if any sand has worked its way down into here, we get that out before it starts grinding pieces to, to bits. Um, so definitely want to see if I can actually manage to get this the rest of the way out and clean that all up. And of course, clean up this gear train. And then we'll see about putting it back together. Um, it's gonna take some time to figure out how all this stuff connects, you know, it's a pretty complex machine, but anyway, so I just kind of wanted to go over what I found so far. Um, I didn't film much of the disassembly because I kind of just, you know, went at it. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I'll go on to cleaning and if I find anything interesting, I will show it on the camera. Can you see the uh, old grease particles coming out the end of the tube there? Let me shake it up a little bit. It's perfectly clear when I put this in here. It's already developing a haze. It's almost prominent now when I first put this in, you can actually see some of the, like the grease particles. Uh, coming out the bottom of the tube there as they get dissolved. So as their base is dissolved and they kind of float free. You can see it's already a nice yellow tinge and it's only been here, you know, maybe a minute or less. Kind of shake it up again. See if we can uh, look here. You know, all those particles in there are, you know, old dry grease particles that the like the thinner is loosened up because I did uh, try flushing this out with brake clean and it is clear now but there's still a bunch of old grease stuck inside there so I'll let it soak in here and let the uh, like thinner dissolve that. I don't see it now but just let that sit for a while. Alright so the um, everything that rides on that shaft that I took out this is the bottommost piece. This is a planetary gear set. So you can see, and I've already started uh, greasing this stuff up for reassembly. So you can see um, the sun gear there in the middle is on a shaft that runs all the way through and out the other side. You can see it rotating there as I rotate the planet carrier. And then the planet gears, there's three of them here. And then the outside ring gear is on the back of this cardboard gear. And so that will go on like that. Um, just want to put a little grease in there first. Um, and then on the very back goes this piece. 
or goes on the end of that shaft and is keyed to it, and that serves as a lock. Um, and you'll notice that the planet carrier also has these teeth here on the outside of it, so you can lock that. So, um, depending on whether this lever comes up to engage or this lever comes down to engage, will determine whether the sun gear gets locked or the pendant carrier gets locked. Um, um, I haven't exactly worked out what that drives yet, but um, just pointing out you know, what I've seen so far. I guess I'm not sure what exactly the drive for this goes to yet, but we'll see when we put it back together. So um, there's that, and then of course this gear drives down to here which is the shift mechanism. So it could be, this is the reversing for the shift mechanism. You know, when it locks this one, then it shifts one direction. And then when it locks the sun gear, it shifts the other direction. Not really sure yet, like I said, but just uh, looking at what's here. Um, so anyway, then this outside of ring gear, so on that side, then this here has, you can see there's little two keyways cut in it for this coupler, which couples it to the back side of this gear, which has a similar face. So then this is pointing towards the outside of the machine. And then that meshes with the smaller gear on this gear set here. And the larger gear of this gear set meshes with the small gear on the uh, motor output. And that's the transfer gear into that. Like I said, I'm not exactly sure what all that drives. Like I said, so far the only thing I see is the carriage shift, which Kind of seems like a complicated mechanism just to drive that, but and again, that's that's the nature of this machine complexity. So, um, I'm just squeezing this up, putting this back together. Um, see if we can pop this guy on the end of the uh, sun gear shaft here. Probably should have. There we go. So that goes on like that. And then, so, if you lock that, and this rotates, if you lock this, then you can see, well, it's kind of hard to hold it. If I hold the planet carrier like that, if you can kind of lock this, you can see this gear rotates that way. If I hold this and rotate the uh, sun, the planet, gears here, you can see it's kind of rotating the other way. Probably should put the gear, let me put the um, ring gear on the outside and then try demonstrating to see if that makes any more sense. All right, so let's see if we can demonstrate this now. So if I hold the uh, planet carrier locks here and rotate this outside of ring gear, you can see that this gear rotates the opposite direction of what I'm rotating the input at. Now if I hold this piece, you'll see that it rotates the same way. So that's your uh, reversing mechanism there. Um, and it seems to rotate the same speed either direction as far as I can tell. So it's like it's just a simple uh, reversing, not a reduction. So that should theoretically drop down in here. We can So I'll have to fight that back in there. Um, and I have cleaned and re-greased this. So if you look at all the holes there, there's a little bit of grease poking out. Now, if I tighten this in, it seems to come out these holes first. So maybe they're relying on the fact that, you know, grease will squirt out of here and fill up this little trough here. And then maybe they're relying on the pressure, you know, cause that'll be underneath, uh, that way. I'll be underneath uh, that gear like that. So maybe they're relying on the pressure building up underneath this gear to force out the other holes. Um, but I will put some grease on the individual parts when I put it together, but kind of you know, thinking about how it's working for its long-term grease application now. I'm so like really impressed that they put that in there. I remember always on a calculator before that had you know, a grease mechanism like that. It's pretty cool. Um, and like I said, I still have to take this apart and see if this has the same thing. It looks like it does, but I went too 
double check. So I'll uh, keep putting this back together and back for anything interesting. Okay, I think it has been, I don't know, maybe two weeks since the last point in this video. Um, I've managed to hopefully get the side uh, correctly back on. Uh, it was not a easy process. Um, basically, th this machine is kind of like a constant struggle, basically. Um, not only can you not see most of the stuff like in here, just because there's so many layers on top of each other, but everything is... I don't know how I put it other than just a struggle. Like, there was one lever in here that it took me, I don't know how many tries of taking this off and putting it back on to finally get the lever to work its way and where it needed to go. Um, you know, when you take the side off, this piece pops out and then it's, it's a bit of filling to get that back in. And then when it goes back in and you put the side on, then you realize that a lever that goes up here is on the wrong side of something else and you have to kind of try and get it right again. And it's just not pleasant to work on. I'll just put it that way. Um, but I think at least addition will work now. Um, anyway, so I'll see if I can go over the exact process of how this machine does a cycle because this is, as far as I know, the only machine where addition is not, you know, just basically one turn of the main shaft of the machine. Uh, this machine is not like that. It actually has three separate clutches that engage at different times just for addition. Um, and it's going to be kind of hard to show because of the different places of them. Uh, this, this is one right here. This is the first one. And then up here on the other side of this gear is the other one. And then right back here is the third one. So when you push the addition key, basically the first thing it does is it trips this clutch. Um, this clutch actually has two uh, trip points in it. So you can see right here there's a slot. And then exactly on the opposite side, when you're out of that, there's another slot. So right now there's a finger in the slot on the inside, uh, keeping this clutch disengaged. If I push the addition key, that finger will raise back, <coughs> tripping this clutch. The shaft will rotate uh, half a turn, at which point the finger will drop into this uh, slot, which will now be, which will now have rotated on the other side. Um, when that's done, it trips the clutch up here, and that clutch is what drives the main uh, shaft to actually do the adding, um, and that makes another half a turn. And then when that's done, it trips the third clutch on the back here, which that shaft makes a full turn. Uh, so basically what this does is this is your setup shaft here. So this will basically read what's on the keyboard or activate the mechanism to read what's on the keyboard, which is right down in here. And that will engage the appropriate gear in the transmission in each column. And then once that's done, then it will actually do the adding. And then the uh, third clutch in the back is kind of like cleanup. Basically that will release the uh, register because when this machine adds, uh, the register in the carriage actually drops down to engage with the um, transmission output. So the, the third clutch on the back is one of the things it does is it disengages that so that the carriage is free to move uh, once the adding cycle is done. Um, now it does not clean up the setup. So once you It'll read what's on the keyboard and set up the right gear to engage in the transmission. And then it stays like that until then the next time you hit the add key, at which point it will engage the correct gears for that cycle. So there's always um, some number basically set up in the machine. Right now it's all zeros. Um, but if I entered say a four in the first column and run the machine, then that four would stay um, activated on this mechanism until the next time I hit the add key, at which point it would set it up for whatever number is next. Um, unfortunately, I can't show that right now because I ended up disassembling the first key column, mainly to see if it could be disassembled easily, and it really wasn't that bad. It basically came all the way apart, uh, which is pretty nice because most machines, um, the uh, key assemblies, so you can see I've taken that whole, well, you can't see because it's not pointing at the right thing. I've taken that whole uh, column out here and disassembled the parts are off somewhere else right now, but 
Um, so that's why I can't show that because all these other columns are C's depth actually. So that'll be something. So you can see this one is free. I can rotate this. Actually, I'll probably rotate this to something like that and do it. I'll try that, I guess. It's still kind of sticky though. But these ones you can see are all frozen. And no, it doesn't have anything to do with these um, because when there's no key press, these should actually be free. Um, it doesn't lock up until you actually have the key pushed down and you can't push the keys down. You can see when I push the key down, it tries to move it, but because it's seized, it won't move. So uh, all the other columns are like that, unfortunately. So that'll take some work to get that cleaned up. But let's see if we can, that's been kind of hard too, because, well, maybe I'll do a couple cycles and see if I can show every part independently. So, um, See if you can see. So this right here, let me get something small on my finger. This shaft right here is the other end of the clutch disengagement shaft. So watch, when I push the add trip, you'll see that this piece right here will come down and it has a little catch that's caught on the top side of this. It will pull this down with it. So if I find you can see that has now been pushed down, which means that this clutch is now disengaged. So when I start turning where the motor would be, right now I'm turning the motor, you can see this whole shaft is rotating and these pieces here are also moving. These are the feelers that will go in and detect what you've entered on the keyboard. So that's another difference too. Most machines, when you hit a number on the keyboard, basically it will you know, line up or engage a like the correct setup so that when the main shaft rotates, everything's already set up for it. That's not the case in this machine. All that this does is this, you can kind of think of it as a setting flags. Um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to show it, but deep inside here, each column has a little barrel and that barrel has a set of um, grooves and what do you call them, pegs on it. So basically when this shaft rotates, these pieces either side will be pinched around that barrel and all of them except for one pair will land on a flat spot and then one pair will either be inside, a, well one side will be inside a groove and this side will be on a peg or opposite. So basically it always ensures that one of these is not in line with the other. So you can see that here, see how all these ones are in line and this one's out of line? So that means that this one, looks like on this side, this one is going into a groove in the barrel and on this side is hitting a peg on the barrel so it rocks the whole assembly that way. And that's how it determines what gear to engage. Now of course all these are zero, so technically nothing is going to be engaged. But if like if I had a one, maybe this would rock. That's interesting. Maybe I stay moved like that. I thought they were hard rock, but apparently not. Anyway. Um, if I had a one, then maybe this would rock the other way. But since I have a zero, it's rocking this way. And like I said, maybe for one, it'll rock this way, or you know, some other piece here will rock differently to decide what gets engaged. So anyway, that will rock all of those like that. As you can see, uh, so this one's further ahead. This one looks like it's back somewhat. So I'm not sure what it's been doing, but. Anyway, so that will um, set whatever gear is to be engaged in the transmission for each column. And now, as this rotates around, you can see, let's see if I can get this so you can see, right there, right here, there's a little roller. That roller is riding up on this cam. Now that roller is attached to a piece that goes back here and so you can't really see but this piece has a finger on it that is now tripping the clutch on the shaft up here so this will now be disengaged and at the same time is also so 
also resetting the addition mechanism or the addition key so the machine will remember what it's doing even if the key isn't pressed down. And those clicks you heard were just the, um, let me show that too. These pieces right here, you can hear there's one here and there's one on the other side. These are what pull the register down to engage. You can see how there's a slot on there. So right now these are pulled all the way down. So that will have pulled the register down to engage with these gears here. So those have just uh, locked into the down position and they will stay that way until the end of the cycle. Let's keep going. So we see right there the addition key is now released actually. And if we look at the top, you can see now these gears are rotating. So that clutch has been disengaged. And now if anything was set up to add, it would be rotating now because this is the main drive that goes through to drive the uh, transmission assemblies. Like I said, this shaft will make a half turn. So now that clutch has re-engaged and you can see it's tripped this clutch here. So now this is disengaged and if I keep rotating, we'll see that now that clutch is rotating along with the shaft. And if you watch these, it will start to rise. There they go. So now the register has been disengaged. And now once this drum here makes a full rotation, that will be the end of the cycle. So that clutch has re-engaged. So now everything is done. And the switch you can see has opened. I should probably be able to see that, but see there's a gap there. So it's, the machine has now turned off the motor because it's done with its cycle and it's ready for the next one. Um, I know this is not a very complete explanation, but you can't, I can't really show anything in there just because everything is so buried. And it's kind of hard to move the camera from you know, this all the way to the opposite side of the machine, especially when it's like this. And if I lay it down, then you can't see this at all. So um, it would kind of make sense though, basically how this works um, really. Really, I can't think of any machine that is even close to this in, you know, the complexity. Like, Frieden has square roots, but when you look inside their machine, it's nothing compared to this, the complexity. Um, it's just kind of crazy, but um, anyway, so I hope that kind of makes sense about the process, at least. Um, as far as the carriage shift, that's controlled back here. You can't really see back in there, but there is a uh, planetary gear set um, that either the planet carrier or the sun gear is locked, and that determines the direction of the output of that. And that drives this gear here, which goes over to a bevel gear and then to a shaft that goes up to the top of the machine where it has a piece with some uh, knobs on it that engage with grooves in the carriage to move the carriage. Um, as far as subtraction, it's basically the same idea with the exception of this right here. So when this goes in, maybe vice versa, maybe that's addition and that's subtraction. Either way, that's the only difference. And what that changes is that determines whether this gear on the opposite side of this assembly rotates in the same direction or the opposite direction. That's all that it does. Everything else is the same. It's just a little uh, reversing up in here. I think that's addition that way, not sure. Anyway, um, and that is controlled by this little rocking assembly here. So I believe when it's like this, it is subtraction. You can actually, you can see that piece moving all the way down in there. So uh, when the machine activates, depending on whether that little raised portion on that shaft down there is underneath that other peg, determines whether or not this, or what state this gets set into. Uh, so when it's backwards like that, it's addition, I believe, and when it's forwards like that, it's subtraction. Um, and then that will determine whether this gets uh, engaged or disengaged um, for setting the different directions. 
So I think what I'm going to do is see if I can do this. I will trip the mechanism. I will hold this in, I don't know, let's hold it, say right there, it should be about six. And now if I start rotating, this should engage the gear for six. Oh, oops, I thought it would stay that way, but it didn't, oh well. Anyway, it shouldn't matter because it's already read that and has engaged the transmission. As you can see, as I rotate this, this is now rotating at the appropriate speed for number six. So if this was a number nine, it would be rotating faster. If this was a number one, it would be rotating much slower. As you can see now, these will be rising to reach the register. Push disengages, it shuts off the motor, and that's the end of the cycle. Um, this piece, I'm actually not sure what this is for. I think it's for, actually, I'm not sure what that's for. Um, might be for releasing the detents when, I think that's what it might be. I think when the register drops, it pushes this down and then this will release the detents, I think, on whatever numbers are engaged, possibly. I have to double check about that, but I believe that's what that's for. Um, so anyway, uh, like I said, whatever number you set here will engage that gear and all these will rotate, will start rotating at the same time or stop rotating at the same time, just as some of them will be rotating at a different speed. Um, now, of course, all these were disengaged, so they didn't rotate at all, but like if I had a 1 here and a 9 here, they would both start at the same time and stop at the same time, but this one would rotate 9 times faster, so it would be 9 teeth, um, you know, engaging there. Uh, these pieces here are the comparators for division. Um, I don't know if we're going to do division in this video. Uh, I kind of want to just get this machine to do something and then move on to something else because this is, like I said, not exactly pleasant to work on. Um, as you can see, this one's kind of, so you can see on this one's kind of bent over, so I'm not sure if that one will work either. I have to see about repairing that. I'm pretty confident if I try to bend this back, it's just going to break off, so I'll have to see about soldering it or something. Uh, there is a piece that I broke down in there, um, that I had to make kind of like a little bracket. I just used this uh, real thin sheet metal and cut out a shape that I could kind of wrap around it to hold it in the shape that it needs to be. And I just soldered the whole thing. And that actually is the other side of this. So this piece here, which actuates the switch, is pinned on a shaft which runs through and that piece is on the other side of that. And as far as I can tell, the main function of that is when the initial clutch trips for the, the additional subtraction cycle, that rod that disengages um, hits on the inside of that lever to turn on the power initially. Uh, I don't know if it has any other function, but that's all that I've seen so far. And I had to, like I said, I had to fix that. So it's not a high stress part, so I'm not worried about it, um, but it's just something that I had to fix. Um, so yeah, uh, I think the next thing to do probably is to see if I can get all of these freed up and then probably reassemble the keyboard column that I took out and then probably put the register on and just see what happens. Um, clearing should work, that's pretty basic. So like if I push one of these clear keys here, you'll see that, you won't see that because you'll see that it um, rotates this and what that does, is it disengages this clutch here. And all that that is, is that clutch is attached to a cam, which when it rotates will push on a roller, which will move probably either this one or this one. Probably this one. So you'll see if I do that and then rotate the motor shaft, which I'll do in a minute, this will move and this has keys on the inside, it's keyed to the 
uh, carriage shaft that runs through here and then the carriage is also keyed to it so when this rotates it rotates that shaft which in turn rotates the clearing mechanism on the carriage itself and then the same idea for this one this is the counter clearing this is the accumulator clearing so let's rotate this back around this way let's see so i will push i'm going in the right direction i think i am push this and that one, actually it's this one, so you can see that this is now moving. And it should, yeah, it's done now. So this is, that uh, clutch has re-engaged and the power is not off though, this needs to move. Okay, so that was just a little bit stuck, that's all. So that would be something to look into. That was just a little bit stuck, it didn't quite fall back in its uh, groove there. And therefore it didn't disengage the power switch. But you get the idea. And the same thing for the simulator crane. Um, so yeah, I think I'll work on, see if I can get at least some of more of these freed up so we can do multi-digit additions and kind of just want to get this machine to at least do something and then move on to something less annoying to work on. All right, so I managed to get all these freed up now you can see they all work. And the issue was that these uh, division trips were set to division mode. So basically, um, they have a kind of like a cup shaped portion down here that rises up to engage with the mechanism that goes from this down to the barrels down there to read what number you have set. Um, and so when those are up trying to read that, then it blocks these from being moved at all. So um, a little, I just kind of rotated that shaft and then it kind of snapped into the disengage state. So these are now in the regular non-division mode and now that freed up all the columns. So it wasn't actually drag V, so it was just these were disengaged. So probably, you know, sometime when I was working around this, they got tripped and then uh, either didn't notice or didn't realize I had to reset them. But they reset now, so that works. And as you can see, I've taken another column out here and I've got that over here. So let's see if we can uh, disassemble or reassemble this here rather. So, um, so it goes in this way, let's see, we have the keys have little tabs on them. So these go that way, yeah, that's a three if you can read it, which is facing up that way, so it goes that way. So we can start with nine, if we can identify the nine key. That looks like a nine. I go like that, so we'll and I've just wiped these off. I haven't done like a deep cleaning here. I just wanted to get uh, that sand off of these so that they weren't. If I can get the spring to cooperate. There. Uh, I just kind of wiped the sand off here and then wipe the sand off the key just so the sand's not, you know, grinding away in there. Um, probably these could do with a repaint probably. Um, I like, they are kind of grimy here, though. They don't really seem to be that rusty. Um, and you only see the keys are in pretty bad shape, so those would definitely need uh, those numbers redone. And even the digit wheels themselves, like the uh, display numbers for the keyboard register, are not the best shape either. Uh, fortunately, most of the mechanical machines did not have any kind of register cover over the registers so the numbers get dirty and then when you try and clean them sometimes they start to come off so um, the model K, some of the model K's have a glass register cover and the Comptometers have a register cover but most of the machines did not have one unfortunately I guess, you know, when these machines were in regular use and you had them serviced regularly, 
probably the service man would clean oops, any dirty digits. When these machines sit in an attic or a closet for 60 or 70 years, I can't even read these keys. Now the dirt accumulates and doesn't always come off in a decent way. I like how bad that is. But you could see if it would focus. Just all. Anyway, it's almost like the block in the middle of the floor dissolved. I don't know what happened to this machine. Even if the paint had come out, the, uh, actually kind of, oh, there it goes. Even though all the paint had come out, the shape of the number should still be there, but these look almost like, this is just, you know, the amount of dirt over top of it's making everything blend together. That could be as well. So, I actually do like the way that these come apart. Um, but the, the old line Martians, if you wanted to take the keyboard assemblies apart this far, you'd have to end up taking some rivets out, I think, and definitely pull the keycaps off, which can often be a destructive operation. they on there for 80 or 90 years, they don't always want to come off. But these ones come apart pretty easy. Um, so, like if, if you would want to repaint the, these keyboard assemblies, this would be the machine to do it on because they come apart pretty easy. Right, so now I just have the clearing button at the bottom. I need one more spring. There it is. Actually, I should have put this in first, but I don't think it will matter. Just slide these all up just a little tiny bit. I should be able to, so you can see there's uh, oblong, oh. you can see there's oblong holes on the bottom there. And I want to spring out. This thing has pins in it. So I need to line up the, and then it slides in. Of course, these have decided to come out, but that shouldn't be too bad. So we'll turn this upside down. Well, at least I thought I would. Of course, now these are not going to end up properly. This key is not, clear key is not cooperating for some reason. Let me take a look at why that is. Seems like this is not one to slide back all the way. But this should go on like this because I think this is what gets hit by the clearing. Actually, this is. Um, but it definitely has to go on this way because as you can see, the two pins right there on the bottom, that's where the spring goes in to pull this back. It's actually just not going back all the way for some reason. So the issue is this, there it goes. Yeah, now I'm back all the way. So for some reason, this was not sliding back all the way. Now it has to back all the way, so now that key is freed up. So now I should be able to turn this upside down, hopefully. It's not the cleanest operation, but... Oh, 
course, all these have come out now, so you can see what I'm doing now. I'm trying to get all of these. That spring has gotten pinched down in there. It's not ideal. That's good, that's good. These ones are cooperating down here. somehow and messed everything else all up. So I'm going to have to turn the camera off and fight with this for a while. I thought I would be able to reassemble this on camera, but it's not really looking like that's going to be the case. I lost a spring. No, there it is. Basically what I'm trying to do is get all these to line up in their holes. Because what I need to do next now we're just down to that one. Will that one not go in? So all these are in, except for the clearing one for some reason. It does not want to go in. There it goes. It's got some dirt on it. Okay, so now that all those are in, there's this piece, which will slide in. It slides in like this. If you can see what I'm sliding this in, I think I am on the side of the keys here, and it's a little more difficult than I thought it would be. This needs to, sure it can't go in the opposite way, it has to go in like this. What the issue is, okay, so all these keys are somewhat loose in their slots here. Slide them all the way over the opposite way so that this thing has space to slide in. Basically what this is, this will keep the keys from uh, popping out the top. I'm going here, I keep knocking stuff on the floor. So I can put this in the last little bit here. This will get screwed in. I think we are good. So now all the keys will stay in. So as you can see right there, the key is a little shelf that rests against that. And that right there is what I was sliding in. So you can see it goes down 
along the back there and all the keys hit up against it on that little shelf they all have so that they can't pop out the top. So now that I've knocked all the nuts for it on the floor, I'll have to pick those up. I just knocked one. And then it's these little screws. Should be these ones. Up. Should go in there. That one's in, of course, you know, when you put the screw, then it'll kind of align itself, but put the rest of these in, and then they got the, the those nuts on the back there. And then, and then, the last one here. Hold this down, see if I can Okay, so those are all in, and then the other side they get some nuts. Charles is coming through on the camera. I'm trying to not mess it up as I go along here. down. Not going to be that much force on this, it's just kind of hold it in place, but generally be held in place by the uh, swing pressure on the keys, so it's not really... Anyway, okay, so that's in, so now I should be able to pop this spring in here, hopefully. So that goes on that little peg, and then I can do this, it will go on. Almost. On. I messed it up. All right, let's try that again. Should should go on that peg. There, and that peg. That spring loads like that, so that when you push a key down, I'm showing you the frame. You can see the ramp there on the key pushes this forward, and then it springs back to lock it, and then when this is pushed forward, it releases. So. That's when it doesn't go down, I hope that one got stuck, that's why. So this one is a bit rusty, is that might be why? Oh, there it goes. And of course, this one clears the entire column. And then uh, when you push, when the machine wants to clear, when you push the clear button, there's a, a rod on the bottom that pushes all these forward, clears all the columns. I should probably push it right here. That's probably what it pushes on. Um, I guess that's what this pushes on. That probably pushes on there. Anyway, something like that. So, with that like that, then we have this, which goes in with the hook end towards the nine. And this is kind of tricky to fish up in here. I fish it up in here and then get these guys on there like that. The same thing for the bottom. The bottom one was kind of tricky to get out. We can't. And of course, the top one came out. I'm not sure they had a different way of assembling these. 
but I mean obviously you have to put this piece on first because it's slotted so it can't slide on with this piece in place. Okay, so that's in. So let's see if we can get this one on the top. There we go. That should go down, and then it has two little um, little boss that it rides on. So let's put a drip of oil there, and then it gets a little washer, which I will wipe off quickly. And then install. And there's still a piece of dirt on it for some reason. And then that gets little nuts. Goes on. Put the little stupid piece of dirt on for there. So that's one of them. And yes, that's too much oil, but that's how much comes out of the container for some reason. And now I need to find one more tiny nut. Should be here somewhere. I have to pause the camera and look for it, unfortunately. It's falling on the floor. So let me find that and then we'll located the nut on the floor. Just install that, hopefully. And just tighten this up a little bit. Yeah, not a lot of stress on those, it's just to locate that. So that should be nice and free, which it is. The idea is this will be swing loaded back like that, and then when you push a key, you can see it will go forward. So maybe something like, kind of hard to, kind of hard to hold it like that, but I think it had to be something a little bit further. So then, so you nine pushes it forwards, and then one lets it fall back, and then zero lets it fall all the way back, and so on. I have to be somewhat a little bit for, forward for nine to catch it, but there's a little bit of a, a boo there. I'm not sure. We'll have to see. Uh, so, anyway, that will go back in the machine. I don't know if you're able to see this, but there's a little knob all the way up in there that it has to hook onto. Can you get it? Almost. There, I think I got it. Go down like that. And screws go in to hold it and a bit of an outline so I know exactly where the screws go, but actually it looks like it will um, be fine just where it is. I have another one here somewhere. I have to go hunt for that, but in the meantime, I'll just tighten this one down here on the bottom. And with any luck, it looks like four. Lines up pretty good with the rest of them. And let's see if we add so four there. So watch this one. Um, yeah, so those things trip. I'm not sure that's supposed to happen or not. I have to check that out. Yep, so it's moving. You can see the keyboard already cleared itself. Yep, so 
I think I had four, I wasn't really paying attention, but I was thinking about why these things tripped that they should not have. So I have to look into that yet. But because those have tripped, that's why it didn't go back to zero, because it should have gone back to zero by now. So you can see the four, because you can't really see, but the four key did pop up. It did clear the keyboard already, and we are at the end of the cycle. So, oops. yeah, this thing. See, so yeah, when I release that thing, it clearly this thing should. I have to figure that out. That thing should not be tripped right now. So something's up with that yet. Um, but otherwise. We should be okay. Yes, you know, that's locked out because of that thing being tripped. So, figure out why that thing trips when it's not supposed to. That's the only trip in division. Um, and we're not doing division. So, figure that out yet. But other than that, I think we might be ready to pop the carriage on and just see what it does. All right, so the carriage has been installed. Uh, let's see what happens if we try a operation. I think this one was clear carriage. So let's give it a try, or a clear counter rather. Let's see, it's see the counter doing something. Getting a little stiff, but. Didn't quite work. Okay. Mm, didn't quite work. Like that one went to nine. Okay, it didn't quite work. That one's kind of at nine. That one's at nine. Let's try it one more time. A bit sticky, I guess. It's supposed to happen. These are all supposed to go to zero. I'm not exactly sure how it does it. I looked into that. This one doesn't want to go to zero. Do it that way. Now that means some uh, figuring out, I guess. That one doesn't want to go past that way. I'm going to go past that way. Yeah, something's messed up with that one. This one. Sure, these are not really. Lined up, so I'm not quite sure what the deal is with that. Uh, with this computer, let's try clear accumulator, see what that does. That would be this one. That one feels a bit stiff too. Oh, 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 right. Kind of. To put a that stupid fellow won't aim. It's probably too much oil. I don't want to get it on the digits themselves. Fortunately, it seems a bit avoidable. Of course, you know, all of these have a, a planetary gear set, so there's quite a bit going on in each position. It feels a bit stiff. I uh, just went over. So it looks like it didn't quite work. It's still not much try it again. I have 
to figure out exactly how clearing is supposed to work. This one feels really locked up. Not quite sure what the deal is with that. That's done, so all right, once again. Sounds like what this one doesn't want to clear out. like a certain point and then interesting so the this doesn't want to go back past zero for some reason that was if I leave it there maybe it worked maybe it went to one I don't know all right, enough playing around with that. I think this is at zero. This is not quite kind of there. All right, let's try adding now. So see if we can do one, two, three. One, two, three. Um, you can see now the register is dropping or should be dropping is actually stuck. I think I'm not able to turn it past that point. So something is up with this register not dropping, I think. So we're gonna have to figure that out. I think the issue was one of the wheels must not have been exactly aligned properly. I just kind of wiggled a little bit and then it popped down. So as you can see it is now dropping. locked in to the engage position and now any luck actually be added now. As you can see they're starting to move. didn't trip the next step, so I take a look into that. All right, now I have disengaged the register. And that's it. So, one, two, three, I guess I put it in backwards, but that's fine. Uh, actually has added, and everything looks to be aligned properly. Of course, it, I'm missing that call. I should probably put that one back together because that's an actual uh, one that I can clean up. One like this one, which I haven't cleaned up, so it's still kind of messed up. But um, this new job successfully added. Um, let's try clearing out the accumulator again and see if. Probably what I'm going to have to do to get this actually be decent is. Um, put the motor in and then just add a bunch of numbers repeatedly to kind of get, you know, the oil worked in. Yeah, see that one's not. Uh, 
kind of get these loosened up. That's the end of that. So let's try it again. Let's try one. Let's not try one because that key is stuck. Try the same thing again. Register is now dropping. It's locked into the engage position. Keyboard has cleared, it's now adding. You can see the numbers turning there. And you can see that they all tone at the same time, just that some turn faster than others. This time I'm engage the next step. So now the register is coming back up. And you are done. And it worked again. So that's good. Um, like I said, see some of these numbers over here are not uh, properly cleared out. So, um, as I probably will have to do is either put the motor in and run this with a bunch of numbers in each column to kind of hook the oil in and loosen up uh, all of this gear train here. Because like I said, each of these gears has um, a planetary drive into the next column. So um, quite a bit to get, you know, kind of sticky, dried out grease in there. Um, but overall, pretty promising actually. Um, seeing how much I had to fight with this and you got it back together, um, actually pretty, Pretty satisfied with this. That it actually, you know, mostly works, and the, part, the parts that don't work, at least for addition anyway, and clearing are due to, um, you know, dried up grease. And actually, this is not even properly aligned. I'll try that and do with it. Let's try clearing again. This column is still kind of sticky. Let's try some bigger numbers. And if this works, what I might end up doing. Okay, so now it's not. Uh, so something is slightly messed up there. I have to slightly misalign the register in order to get it to engage, so that's not quite right. So I'll have to take a look at what the deal is there. See, is that turning much faster now? They're in a higher gear. Slightly distorted. That's interesting. This does not trip the next stage again, I think. That's when they up with that too. It doesn't really trip the next stage. It was working reliably before I put the carriage on, so I figure that out yet. Looks like now the carriage is not wanting to disengage, I think we're still. Yeah, so now it's not tripping the final clutch to release, so something's messed up. Let's deal with that too, and I think it might be. I'll have to fight with that. No, so the issue was um, it has little detent fingers that come in to lock the uh, transmission, the gears on top of the transmission when it's done. And for some reason, sometimes they don't always engage properly. Like 
some of the, the output gears of the transmissions are slightly misaligned and so they don't let the locking fingers come in which then uh, you know, kind of stops the whole cycle and it's part of the chipping process in some way, I'm not exactly sure how. But the idea, basically the point is when those can't engage, it doesn't continue the cycle of the machine. Um, so I think hopefully the issue is just, you know, some stickiness there that they don't always, um, you know, because theoretically they should be pretty loose with the fingers can just come in and, you know, lock them in place. So um, hopefully, you know, working it and oiling it will hopefully uh, loosen that up. Um, but another con uh, main concern right now is you can see how this register is not, so now it's engaged there, but if I leave it there, it will jam when it tries to drop. So you have to move it over, or just slightly kind of like that. And now when it tries to drop, it'll work. So that's an issue. Uh, I have to figure out why that is. Um, I'm not sure what the deal would be with that, but um, I have to figure that out. And once that's figured out, hopefully everything else is, at least first anyway, it's just, you know, sticky parts, but uh, we'll see. Um, yeah, definitely um, pretty satisfied so far with the progress here. You know, when I had this whole thing apart, I kind of wanted to just give up on it. I didn't really think I would get this far, but um, yeah, it's uh, almost mostly working for addition at least. All right, so as you can see, I've got the uh, motor reinstalled. Um, that was a bit of a fight to get in and get wired back up. Um, just the nature of this machine, nothing goes smoothly. Um, it was pretty hard to get it lined up properly to get the bolts to go on the bottom of it. Um, so I decided to do that first before attaching the wires because I figured, you know, having the wires in there would just make it even harder to get it lined up. Um, you know, when the wires are attached and trying to push it different directions. Um, so I was able to do that and then of course it was difficult to get the wires hooked up, but it is hooked up now and... See, it does run. It's a lot louder than um, my other silent speed, so that's somewhat concerning, although I don't really see how anything, like what would be causing that. Um, not too sure. There doesn't be anything that really loosen the gear train, but um, if you push the plus button, see it does go through a cycle. Be able to see this or not, but it does add, so um, we're getting somewhere. I think what we're going to do is run this machine through a bunch of cycles with a bunch of numbers. So if I do that and then push the uh, multiply button, well, it was supposed to continue, it did not, so that's an issue. There it goes. I don't know if you can see now, but it looks like one of these shafts is bent or something. The whole assembly is moving while it's running, so that's interesting. I'll have to look into that. Um, but the machine is once again moving under its own power, although this doesn't really sound the best. So probably what I'll do is just play around with it a little bit more. <clears throat> I don't know if you can really see. They it looks like the whole assembly is wobbling, almost like one of the shafts is bent or something. On the kind of odd. But it does um, run and complete the cycle. Let's try a bunch more. Well, that one's not going to work, but... I don't know why this whole thing is moving. That does slightly concern me. I'm not sure what the deal is there. Well, it does seem to work and complete the cycle. So, I don't know. Um, I did find out the reason why the carriage um, got pushed over when I tried to drop the register, and that is because this piece right here, which you can't see, this piece right here uh, comes up 
to align the, um, the register before it drops. And this is bent slightly, so it tries to push the register over as this comes up. Uh, that finger there goes into it goes into each of these spaces right here to I it goes into yeah, I'm pretty sure it goes into those spaces there and yeah you can see here the uh, the wear there uh, from that thing starting up so uh, that's what that's for um, like I said it is slightly bent so that's why it's pushing the uh, carriage over uh, every time it tries to engage the register. So I'll see if I can bend that back into shape and then hopefully um, I'll put the register back on here or the carriage back in here rather and hopefully we'll be ready to add under power. Alright, let's see how we do here. Um, obviously there's still some stickiness in the registers. Just, they're just not clearing out uh, that one's not clearing out. Actually, I guess that's the only one there that's not clearing out. And no matter how often... Hey, that one cleared. Cool. So that one's stuck. That one's iffy, probably related to the stickiness there, but... Maybe they'll loosen up, maybe they won't. Um, I really don't want to disassemble all these because like I said, each of these has a planetary U set in there, and I'm not sure if they have to be timed um, when you put them back together. But anyway, let's see if we do. Well, one, two, three. Yeah, it looks like that went for subtraction, which it was not supposed to do. Um, because this has to be back. I think there's supposed to be a spring on that, um, which I have not yet installed. But it really shouldn't matter when you have the keyboard on because when you push the plus key it actually pushes that back and would um, fix that so of course this one key is stuck but let's see if we clear out looks like that's cleared it out and I try to get one two three this goes back All right one two three so let's add it in see if we can pop this one key Back up, so we got one, two, three, try, well, it would try four, see so if we can, and it's not gonna happen. Um, okay, let me reassemble this other keyboard column and put that back in. Um, I really don't wanna get into taking all of these apart right now, and we'll see if we can uh, continue from there. Now, as you can see, I have reassembled and reinstalled this keyboard column here. So let's try this again. One, two, three. And yes, this one I have not rebuilt yet. Uh, I was trying to get through this demo without having to rebuild anymore. So I'm not really interested in uh, not doing this machine, you know, fully functional at this point. I just want to see if it'll actually do anything. I'll make sure this is set back for addition. And one, two, three. This would have popped up if it had been free. Let's try four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, and three, two, one. There we go, three, zero. So that is functional. The counter is doing something. Looks like I have this in um, count. Uh, subtraction when I say count additional, so let's set that. That's what this switch over here does. You can, you can see. Um, I don't want it that way, but let's see what happens. All right, so let's see if we can clear that clear. Counter clearing is not really working. Um, let's try addition again and see if it. Uh, counts the right way this time. Right, I was counting that way. Let's try it that way. Why did it stop working? Right, for some reason, the switch uh, didn't trip. Uh, looks like it's counting backwards 
both ways actually, so that has to be looked into, I guess. Um, hmm. I don't know if that's not throwing that far enough. Or it could be the parts you see together, so probably check that out. Alright, so those are cleared out now. So now I have it flipped this way. Let's see what happens. So you're still counting for subtraction, so let's flip it this way. Clear it, there we go. Hopefully that'll loosen up. Um, so I'll flip this the other way, see what happens now. No, I still counting subtraction. So let me poke that a little bit. If that's a quick fix, I'll do that before we continue here. Now that's under power, I can just hold down the clear key and use it to clear out at least these three. Something's still messed up with that one. I'm not quite sure what. What happens now? Yeah, it doesn't want to. For some reason. I'm not sure what the deal is. Oh, this one is messed up. Maybe it'll stay there. I don't know. Anyway, uh, let me figure out about, or at least try to figure out about this uh, counter direction thing. Now, I think the issue was back here. Um, I'm sure you can see, but right down in there, this gear and that gear constantly have a little slot cut in them. And um, now when you flip the switch, see how that little thing slides from one slot to the other to choose either this gear or the other gear? To engage to, I guess I need to lock it to the shaft, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm assuming that's what it does. Um, anyway, what's happening was this, that little slider there was always locked in this gear because for one thing, this was at a time, so when the machine was at the home position like now, this gear was rotated so that the, sh the slot didn't line up, so we could never slide over to lock this one. Uh, so the first thing I did was loosen up, uh, took this out so I could move this over and loosen up with another screw down here so I could move this over a little bit to move the gear over to rotate it, so now it's back in time again. And then the second thing was, this was not sliding all the way over, so it was kind of stopping in the middle, which would engage both and kind of lock it up. Uh, and that was because I had this nut here off the side. Uh, this big uh, bolt with this nut on it is what this piece here pivots on. So um, because that was out, this was not held all the way over so it wasn't pulling that shaft all the way over. Um, but now hopefully it'll work. I haven't tried it yet. But uh, let's go back around to the front and try it. Alright, so let's try this again. One, two, three. And now it's counting up, so that's good. So now I got a one there. If I do four, five, six. Now it's counting two. Three. Alright, good. So that seems to have fixed that issue. We'll clear that out. All right, so we can try a subtraction. Let's add something in, say, I don't know. Add in 45, and now if I pull this back, and let's subtract, say, nine. If I set this back, it should subtract. Yep. All right, cool, so that seems to work. And also count it back, which was a fraction. So, okay, let's try multiplication, why not? Let's try uh, 6, 25, and this should be back for addition. Now we wanna hold this down till we get a five there. We'll do 625 times 625, so we're gonna get a five there. Oops, too many. Uh, and actually, the multiplication and the this is the shortcut key. Um, do the subtraction or the addition and subtraction selection automatically. So when you push this down and push that down, it will auto rotate this. So actually, you don't have to worry about that for those operations. All right, so we have a five there. Um, one supposed to be there. 
not sure if that's right. Well, let's continue and see what happens. Now we want to shift this way. Nope. Nope, too far. Uh, so shifting works, that's cool. Um, I did turn that over by hand with the shifting uh, to make sure it wasn't going to jam, so I'm uh, not super surprised by that. But um, what I was having before was an issue where it wasn't quite making it all the way, and I'm glad to see that now under power it does actually have enough momentum to complete the shift. Uh, so that seems to be fine. All right, so now we want to have a two there, so I'll just hit this twice. All right, and now we will move over one more. Too far again. The key is kind of sticky. Uh, so now we want to have a six there. Too many. All right, so that is not correct. Um, I'm assuming it's some issue with the carries, probably. That should be 390625. It ended up being 600625. So these three digits are right. Nothing past, yeah, this is right. It should be a 39. Oh, this is awful loose. Should be a three nine, and so we got a six zero. So these four digits are right, um, but the rest are not. And try it again. Uh, so six twenty five. So we'll go for five here again. Doing that double shift, so it's kind of sticky yet. Or do just one. Not too many. Hey, now it's right. Three hundred six two five. All right, cool. So that's probably just some uh, stickiness in there. Um, I'm not sure if I properly explained this, but this is all analog, actually. So. Um, because it's not just the input from the um, the transmission output gear driving these, also the planetaries drive across. The planetaries are the carry. So you know most machines they'll do the addition part, and then after the addition part's done or the subtraction or whatever, then they uh, go over and do all the carries all the way across. But this machine doesn't do that. This machine, the only operation from the main body of the machine to the uh, carriage is add or subtract. Um, and then the carries are handled inside the carriage itself via the planetary gear sets. So basically as this wheel is turning, say right now on sat 5, the planetary drive has actually rotated this wheel halfway in between 2 and 3 because it's halfway in between a full carry, sat 5. The reason why it doesn't look that way is because there's a spring-loaded adjustment that when the register springs back up out of its drop position, the spring-loaded ad adjustment um, rotates it, rotates the display piece um, to, you know, a digital position so it displays the number exactly through the window instead of displaying it halfway between two and three. Um, so you'll see sometimes in these machines where They'll, not all the numbers will line up with the windows, and that's just because you know something is gummy with that spring-loaded detent and the planetaries, but it doesn't have that adjustment to adjust it to display properly. Oh, that's all that that is. And you know, usually if you run it and oil it and you know get it unstuck, it'll come back and see this one's you know everything lines up. All those the spring-loaded detents, not detents, spring-loaded adjustments are all working here. Um, and same with the uh, carriage as well, or the counter rather, it has the same sort of setup, but it's also planetary carry all the way across. So basically, you know, this is at five, so it's driven this mechanism halfway in between a full digit. And then through the planetary gear set, this is also driven this offset a little bit because this is only at a two, plus the offset carried off from this. So essentially, you know, if you have a five here, you know, that transfers, you know, half rotation, or not half rotation, half a digit to here, and then that would also transfer, you know, a little teeny tiny bit over to here and so on, all the way across the register. You know, by the time you get out here, that, that difference is so minute, you wouldn't even notice it, even without the uh, spring-loaded adjustments, but it is there. Um, so yeah, what messed it up before could have just been, you know, the spring-loaded um, 
adjustments or maybe it was you know partially adjusted before and then stuck there so it never actually fully reset the entire planetary i don't really know what i do know is now it seems to be working maybe we'll try it once more and see if it'll be uh, consistent now um yeah so we can clear this out all the way back there make sure this is locked in which it has not didn't quite lock in so that might be an issue uh anyway so we want to get to five here again and this machine is so fast it's very hard to get to do that um to hold this down the right number of hold this down the right length of time to get the right number there because the machine is so fast it's very easy to overshoot as you've seen me do here. Um, that's why for two I just hit it twice because holding it down you know you're just going to way overshoot that. Now I'm cutting out too early. Alright so 3965 so that's consistent again. Um, Alright cool. Now for the shortcut, what we could have done, let's go back. Is that locked in? I think it has, yes, that's good. So for the shortcut, what we can do is, this is a five, so we'll just do the regular five. Yep, two more. All right, we'll do the two. And now what we can do is, well, I guess what I better do is go over one more. And now we'll do a one here. Well, we would if this would. I don't know why it does it. Sometimes it doesn't always trip the power switch for some reason. Not quite sure what the deal is there. For some reason this is added. Well, maybe that's just carriage over. Um, and now what we can do is you can go back one. And now we want to do the shortcut, which will actually do subtractions until this says uh, six in it. So basically four operations here. And there we go, 3905. You can see this one, the swing loaded adjustment didn't quite adjust it back right there. Um, but that's the idea with shortcut. If you have um, a number over six you want to multiply by, instead of holding this down to get to that number, you can just add one in the next column and then use the shortcut key to subtract in the previous column, uh, so that way it's less operations. Now, um, now in this case, we would have had to hold this down until that read six, that would have been six additions, uh, whereas the other way with the shortcut, we only ended up doing one addition here and then four subtractions here, so that's only five operations actually. And of course the maximum efficiency when you get up to nine, where you can do just one addition and one subtraction, so instead of doing nine additions, you can do two operations um, just a little bit faster. Of course, this machine is so fast, you probably wouldn't really notice the difference anyway. Um, but just kind of a cool feature they had there. Um, and the reason why it has separate keys for multiplication and basically repeated subtraction versus the addition subtraction keys is this machine has no repeat switch. So like a lot of machines, um, there's a repeat switch where you can set it and then regular additions and subtractions won't clear the keyboard. Um, but this doesn't have that. Addition and subtraction always clear the keyboard. Um, and if you don't want to clear the keyboard, you have to use the shortcut um, or the multiplication of the shortcut keys. Um, why they did that, I don't really know, but um, probably they did that because of the complexity of the cycle. Because addition always starts with a setup and then an add and then a you know, reset, or whatever you want to call that word, it releases the register. Um, but for multiplication, you only have to do the, um, the setup once, and then you just are stuck in the add cycle repeatedly until the key is released, and then you do the cleanup once. Um, so if they just had a repeat key for the keyboard, you have to tie that repeat key in to the setup and the cleanup cycles to make sure that those didn't happen for every edition anymore once the repeat key is engaged. Uh, so I'm assuming that's why they went with the separate keys for um, multiplication and shortcut. So they didn't have to figure out how to do a tire repeat key in there, you just have this and this which 
uh, lock it in the ad cycle until the key is released. But anyway, um, yeah, so I'm not going to bother to try to vision for this going to just mess things way up and then the machine's not going to work anymore. Um, although I should say the machine's going to get into a state where I have to figure out how to get it to work again, uh, which I really don't want to do you now that I have some of these functions. Um, so what's the future for this machine? I don't know. Um, cosmetically, it's really not in the best of shape. Um, oops, no, I just messed that up. I'm clean up this zero a little bit here. Uh, it keeps rotating. Um, like I said, cosmetically, it's not in the best of shape. These number wheels are pretty dirty, and while well, some of them are cleaning up a little bit, the point where you can actually read the zeros again, like that one there. This one I was trying to wipe off, but it's not really cleaning up like some of the other ones did. Um, all the keys are pretty bad. Basically, you have to take the remains of the paint out of those and repaint them. Um, all of these keyboard columns have to be rebuilt. I've only rebuilt these two, but the rest are all, you know, covered in sand and all sticky, and this one doesn't even latch. Uh, so all those have to be cleaned and rebuilt. Um, the vision will have to be figured out and made to work. Um, yeah. Um, so, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this. Right now, I'm going to set this aside and work on something else because I, said, I spent quite a bit of time on this and kind of getting annoyed with it. But, um, yeah, I'm at least satisfied that I got it partially working. Um, like I said, addition works, subtraction works, clearing works, you know, except for maybe some stuck digits here and there. Uh, multiplication and a shortcut work. Uh, shifting mostly works except for this one sticky key that sometimes shifts twice. Um, but for a complex machine, I'm actually pretty satisfied that I got that far with it, um, given how painful this has been to work on. Um, oh, another thing, I should probably uh, go over the um, wiring for the motors. Let me unplug this and flip it back around and explain how that's set up. Okay, so you can see we have the power plug here. Now, one side of this plug is connected directly to one lead coming out of the motor. The other side runs up to the switch uh, next to the keyboard, uh, which later versions of the science we didn't have. They eliminated that later, but this is an earlier one, so it does have that switch. I checked the serial number. I think this one was made in 1935, uh, so just one year after they were introduced. They were introduced in 1934. Um, so anyway, power goes from here up to the switch, and then back from the switch over to this switch, uh, which is the um, you know, motor control for the mechanism so that the motor doesn't run all the time. Uh, and then from there, it goes off to two places. You see one wire goes up here, and then there's a big fat resistor up here. And another wire runs back to the governor assembly. Um, and basically where the governor assembly works is when the motor is not at its speed limit, it will send power directly from this wire coming out of the switch directly into the motor. When the motor has reached its speed limit and the governor wants to limit the speed, it will disconnect that and instead power flows up through this wire through the big fat resistor and then down into the motor. So, let me see, and this is unplugged by the way, I'm sure you can see, it's sort of like all poking in here. Um, so this wire here comes out of the resistor and goes into this bracket. This bracket runs all the way down to the bottom where the other motor lead is. So when the, when the machine is at speed limit, or when the motor is at speed limit, uh, the power flows from the plug up to the keyboard switch, back to the uh, control switch, and then through, up through the resistor, down to this bracket, and then down into the motor, and then from the motor back out to this plug here. Uh, when the machine is not at its speed limit, uh, current flows from the input plug up to the switch, back to the control switch, back through uh, this wire down here, underneath, and then up on this side up here, there's another connection, not sure if you can really see, but this little white thing down there. Uh, that's it where that wire connects to right there. And then it connects to this braided piece here. 
which is attached to this pivoting switch here. If you can see, but that switch there has points on it. You can be opening and closing in there. So uh, power will flow through that wire up through this little braided piece here onto this bracket. And then when the points are closed, it'll flow through the points and then onto this bracket again and then down into the motor. Uh, when the machine reaches its speed limit, uh, see if we can rotate this around here. At the governor piece, which is right here. So when the machine is at its speed limit, let's see if I can hook this. Right, so when the machine is at its speed limit, this piece will fly out. You can see it opens the points there. When he's at a speed limit, it opens the points, cuts off the path of direct power, and forces the only current flowing to the motor to go through this resistor. Um, so the motor is never completely shut off by the governor. Uh, just The governor just switches between direct power and uh, power dropped to this resistor. That's all. Um, so if, you need, if you've taken this apart and want to figure out how it goes back together with the uh, motor at least, that's kind of the description of operation there. Um, pretty basic system once you just take a look at it and see how it's set up. Um, also, there is a suppression capacitor, which I have no idea if that's so good. Um, it hasn't exploded yet, but that doesn't really mean anything. Um, that is up underneath the switch, so and that's just connected uh, directly across the uh, line here. Uh, so there's another wire that runs back from that to this pin. So there's actually two connections on this pin, one coming out of the motor and one coming out of that capacitor. And then the wire that goes up to the switch, I think there's just one wire on that side, I believe. There's just one wire for everything going up to the switch. Um, that's also connected to the other side of that capacitor. Uh, so that's just for noise suppression because of the brushes in the motor and also the points that are always opening and closing and also these points that are opening and closing here. Um, you know, because when this machine was made in the 30s, you know, FM radio hat wasn't even on the market yet, so everybody's using AM radio, so all that, uh, all these switches and brushes and everything are going to make quite a bit of a uh, AM radio interference, so that's why they have that um, suppression capacitor. But anyway, uh, I think that's going to be about it for this video. Um, I don't think my explanation is quite as good as I wanted it to be of how this machine actually cycles, but I hope to give you at least an idea of uh, kind of the main operating points of how this works. Um, you know, I don't know what, what every single piece of this machine does. There's just so many of them, and I haven't you know looked into everything. I don't even know how to, I haven't really even even looked into the division mechanism at all. Um, but as far as the basics, basic principles, uh, I hope that at least made some sense. So um, this going to be out for this now. Um, maybe this will come back in the future and we'll play with the vision. Um, maybe it will go on a shelf and look old for a while. But anyway, I'm going to do this video and thank you for watching.